All right. Well, here we are. Uh, gotten together for uh, for a conversation about worship in the time of pandemic, and we're here. And uh, I think a good place to maybe start, as we talked a little bit about beforehand, is to sort of ask the question, um, why now, and what's given us energy as we've jumped into this to this conversation. And I'm uh, I'm willing to kick it out and and see uh, who'd like to to start us off. You know, as the pan as the pandemic was you know it was becoming more obvious that this is a really serious thing um people started asking me the question of what have pandemics done to churches in the past and so mm -hmm. basically what happened from my perspective uh raising these issues is that i began to be asked historical questions and so you know i, I went back and i and i looked at especially around the black death but there are, and that's in the 14th century uh but the the other places that I was also looking uh, were places in sort of Western Europe and in North America where there had been big smallpox outbreaks and um, other kinds of typhoid fever, places where there were huge epidemics that had a sustained social impact on institutions or communities. And so I think that the thing that I, I noticed as, you know, I just kind of looked across the historical record is that religious institutions did two things, sort of one of two things. Uh, one is that people with, who were religious people tended to run towards illness. Um, and so they set up hospitals and tents and tried to meet the needs um, of the communities that were under stress and, and people who were sick. Um, and, and we can't really do that in this particular pandemic we're told that essentially caring for others means withdrawing from people, which is, a, mm -hmm. I think, really psychologically mm -hmm. hard on Christians mm -hmm. who have a desire to want to go and hold the hands of the sick mm -hmm. when people are suffering. And so I think that that's been kind of a strain. But then there's this other aspect of things that happened around religion, and that is traditional religious authorities found themselves challenged. Um, a lot of the structures of religion tend to erode uh, during times of pandemic. And so, you know, people within the authority structures died. Um, in the Middle Ages, when the disease came, people ran into churches to pray to God. And what happened, of course, is that the church community became a vector of transmission and nuns and priests and brothers and people who were in authority were the first people to get really, really ill. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the structure of church um, often finds itself in a crisis during the time of pandemic. And so that mm -hmm. naturally got me to think about what our responses were right now. And I began to see across the, the internet, um, mm -hmm. people responding really well. There, I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of creativity out there right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there was this real problem that was clearly developing around liturgical churches. And that is people did not know what to do about the main service of worship, and that is mm -hmm. Eucharist. And, mm -hmm. and so that was my passion. It was a historical question about mm -hmm. the failure of institutions and the threat that institutions are under during times of mm -hmm. pandemic. And then noticing that there was a particular crisis emerging around liturgical churches. And I happen to be an Episcopalian, so I noticed mm -hmm. pretty quickly that there was a lot of argument about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'll say, I'll jump in and say, I think what's given me um, so much uh, passion about this is that I can still remember um, when I was growing up um the moment when uh when i was given a homework assignment and uh and i was uh, required to get on my computer at home uh and we had dial up internet and uh it took forever for my computer to get online and uh and i can remember having to uh make a decision about whether or not i would uh take the time for the modem to get online, to research what I needed to research and to write what I needed to write, uh, or whether or not I would walk over to the bookshelf and I would grab the Encyclopedia Britannica 
and I would simply open it up, find out what I need to do, and to write my uh, and to write my 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 homework. Uh, I, I'm in that sort of um, I've been in that sort of a bridge place between the world of text and analog and uh, and it is a it is a world where 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 knowledge is fixed and where uh, things are stationary and you go to the experts and where I've always had this hunch that um, if we could get to what was on the other side of the screen or if we could connect more uh, more uh, in real time or if we could get to, to even more what's out there it's almost kind of how my prayer and discernment life is as well but if we can spend more time um, engaging God in this kind of a way, um, then there, there's a fuller, more beautiful, more connected uh, way of being or of knowing that maybe we can share together. And so for me, um, this led me um, in, uh, in both co in college and after college and then in seminary as well to keep asking the digital question, to keep reading uh, Marshall McLuhan, who people thought was crazy, to keep having conversations with our with our friend uh, Phyllis Tickle and with with so many others about what in the world does this is this digital thing, this digital world that we are living in that's changing every aspect of our society, including how we understand relationships with each other, how we understand knowledge, how we understand authority. Um, how is it going to keep reshaping us? And so. Um, I, I got to be honest, when I finished seminary, I kind of just, I, I wrote a thesis on it. I kind of set it over on the side uh, and I've been practicing ministry for like the last 10 years because there's been no, uh, there's been no like reason why people like, there's been no reason why people would sort of say like, well, of course the, the, the digital or the virtual is a, is a real experience because both has been happening. And I think when the pandemic arrived and we were automatically um, thrust into this moment, what I began to realize was, is, oh, wow, like this, we've been practicing this for a decade now. And people already believe that they can go to church online and people already uh, are in social groups together uh, virtually and digitally. People already have a, a custom of caring for one another through caring bridge pages or, or whatever it is. And, and so let's talk about this. It's, it's natural. It's a normal, natural extension. And, um, and actually I found as many of us have that that's, that, that almost begins to feel like a bridge too far. And I think um, it both surprises me and it doesn't surprise me. Um, but I think that's sort of the arc of my own personal engagement with, uh, with the topic. And I think why it continues to be um, so important for me. Let me jump in after that, because um, you reminded me, Joshua, that, that really my writing about this just recently is also connected with stuff about a decade ago, mm -hmm. um, because I started writing things about a decade ago about Scotland. I, I live in Scotland, and um, mm -hmm. part of the history of the church in Scotland has been about being unable to provide um, ordained ministry for the challenging geography. We have lots of people mm -hmm. spread out across a wide area. In fact, you might even say we don't have lots of people, we have a very, very few number of people spread out over a wide area. And how to meet them with an ordained ministry has been part of the struggle of different denominations. And going right back, it's one of the triggers of the Reformation in Scotland, is how to, um, how to pro provide for people. Mm -hmm. and, and about 10 years ago, I started writing a few really kind of satirical articles, really, about, I, I, I conjured up two island communities um, which are not too difficult to imagine here. There are island communities. And I said, you know, what happens if you have a priest on one island and you have people on the other island uh, and, and the, the, um, the, the, the ferry boat uh, uh, won't run on a Sunday because people believe in the Sabbath, uh, but Father would like to celebrate the Eucharist for both communities. Is there any way that this can be done? You know, it, can we do this in a, in a live uh, environment? Can we do this with a, a screen? Um, would it be possible if they went down to the shore and could see one another across the, the water? Could, could Father actually consecrate the elements at a distance that way, but not actually do it in a virtual space? Uh -huh. um, so that conversation, and I remember that was quite a vibrant conversation, and the answers then were much the same as now. Some people say, oh, yeah, maybe. And other people say, absolutely not. This is, this is a bad thing. This is a bad conversation to have. Um, so... 
Yeah, I started to think about this about 10 years ago and started to ask the yeah. questions. I've been struck recently in the last few weeks when this has become the reality for the whole church to think about what to do now. I've been very struck by the number of people who have said, well, we can't do anything because the theology hasn't been done, the thinking hasn't been done, the imagination right. hasn't been done, the conversation hasn't been happening. And I've been saying, huh? Yeah. I think it has. I think quite a lot of people have been having this conversation. So yeah. um, there, there are people not hearing uh, and there are people who have been speaking and not being heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know Deanna is going to jump in real quick, but I just want to underscore, you know, my passion for history is around these very things is that a, as a historian, I'm not afraid of change. I just, I know that unexpected things happen. And when those unexpected things happen and unwelcome things, they sort of break into our reality and raise questions that have been often implicit in communities for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And if those questions are not dealt with in creative and imaginative and hopeful and courageous ways, what happens is the conventional religious authority crumbles. And, and my passion is, I don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so as a historian, mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of change. I know that this is a moment that is going to mean change. And there is uh -huh. literally nothing that any of us mm -hmm. can do about that except respond in some faithful fashion. And if we don't, you know, think through these things creatively, yeah. then the worst option will occur. And the worst option is that the churches will become even more marginalized and less able to address these issues as we move into the future. So, so that's part of that passion. I'm sorry, Deanna. Mm -hmm. but no, no, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, my um, kind of involvement or passion in this issue um, started about 11 years ago. I'm a theologian. Um, I was very skeptical of digital technology, didn't own a cell phone and was very self-righteous about that. <laughs> um, my kids didn't own cell phones. I was also very self-righteous about that um, and really was very skeptical about how any kind of relationality, any positive connection could happen digitally. And then um, I got diagnosed 11 years ago with stage four cancer and my world completely turned upside down. and. I, my world that had been really rich and interactive and out in the world became, it shrank and I was limited to my house mm -hmm. and I was limited to the oncology wards. And um, I was introduced to the way in which digital technology can facilitate meaningful, transformative healing connection um, when people are isolated and unable to be you know personally in person connected in person um, and then i started to talk about my experience of i call, started calling my experience of being supported virtually the being embraced by the virtual body of christ mm -hmm. um, and started having an experience i've always been a huge fan of the local church um, but started to kind of get introduced to this Church Universal um, through mm -hmm. digital technology. Um, I was being prayed for by people all over the world, um, being connected in those ways. And that, I found that just incredibly profound. Wow. Um, and the very first time I presented on the virtual body of Christ to like a group of theologians, um, I had a seminary professor come up to me afterwards and he says, you need to publish this right away. Like my takeaway of what you said is that the body of Christ is happening virtually, whether or not the church acknowledges it. <laughs> and I was like, "Woo! like that's actually a really, yeah. really insightful. Like I didn't know that that's what I was saying, but that wasn't kind of what I was saying. Um, and so then I wrote a book on the virtual body of Christ and have been speaking about like how churches need to pay attention to the reality that the body of Christ is happening virtually, right? And, and how can the church actually be a part of what's happening outside um, beyond the walls of the church and since I have published that book in 2016 I've been asked like so what do you think about virtual communion what do you think about online you know having communion as part of online worship 
And I was like, yeah, that's a great question. That'd be something for us to discuss at some point. Um, and really, I mean, it feels kind of like a divine joke that I'm talking and speaking about this when I was so anti all of this not that long ago. So, um, so I was resistant to getting into this conversation. And when the pandemic started, I started getting, um, you know, a lot of people talking to me about my book and like, are you going to weigh in on this issue of virtual communion? My, my own pastor, like called me up and was like, we really need your help here at our church, you know, to think through these issues. Um, and then, um, a Bishop of the Lutheran church contacted me and he said, um, you know, the church is saying we should be fasting. Um, the, the presiding Bishop of the Lutheran church, we should be fasting from communion. And this is, seems, okay for Lent. But meanwhile, like half the churches in my synod are celebrating communion or virtually, or they're preparing to do so during Holy Week and Easter. Um, and at that point, I thought, okay, if, if this is what's on the ground, um, and we have no theological, really like almost no theological guidance on doing this, it seems like a time for me to wade in. Um, so that was really what pushed me over the edge is like starting to hear that all these church communities wanted to wanted to meet their members where they were at and wanted to provide this um, for them and wanted some backing theologically and um, and then you know a kind of way to think through this. Um, so that's that's how I've yeah. gotten into this, and that's where my passion is. You know, it's so it's like it's the beautiful reminder, and I think you brought up for it, it's brought up for me again that um, that sense of why I think it's important. I think um, one of the reasons why this is important for me as well is because like, I have a deep sense of the communion of the saints, um, like a deep sense that those who who came before us in the faith are a part of the cloud of witnesses and that uh, and that we're connected and that their faith can strengthen us and we can be strengthened by their faith and the witness of their faith. And, you know, I just keep going back to how thankful I am that um, some innovators came up with a technology uh, that allows the incarnation of people's faith and of their lives to be known to me in real time in this moment. And yeah. You know, for for us in this in this very space right now to be able to be in four different places and to be bearing witness to um, to to God's spirit and to what and to and to try to talk about and grapple with what God's up to in the world is uh, is an, for me another testimony to just how incarnational this is. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, um, right. one of the one of if like one of the pieces of pushback that I often hear when I'm having this conversation is like, um, well, you're talking about digital and you're talking about uh, virtual and it it's almost and you know what it is so not incarnational, mm -hmm. like it it is not incarnational, and and I keep kind of wanting to sort of say like, I, I scratch my head a little bit and I go, no, actually I believe that the matter matters. Like, I, I believe that the person right. on the other side of the screen is an actual person existing in continuous space and time who is participating by virtue of their own prayers and thoughts in a more cosmic prayer of thoughts that are happening. And that's not like disembodied. That is, that is for me, it's an even broader sense of what embodiment is made possible by, by the technologies. And so, um, I think that's that ongoing sense for me. If I if I think about you know what what's some of the pushback that I hear, or how do I continue to to grapple with this? Um, you know, I I kind of think about that too. The the pushback piece, and it does a lot of it comes from that idea of embodiment. And mm -hmm. um, there a lot of people are throwing around terms, saying things like, "Oh, all these people who want to do virtual Eucharist are only Gnostics," and <laughs> And, and I think to myself, especially when people have come at me and said, oh, you're being Gnostic. And I said, well, that's not when you, what you said four years ago when I wrote a book called Grounded, which was about embodied spirituality, then you called me a pantheist. <laughs> and so 
I'm, I, I, that has really made me wonder, you know, well, what's really going on here? Because people are, pe this sort of the same people who have objected to different parts of the body of work that I've been doing mm -hmm. about the future and about spirituality and about mm -hmm. kind of how we live now in the world um, through mm -hmm. and with God. Um, really, only just a few months ago, they were calling me pantheists and now mm -hmm. they're calling me Gnostic. And so what, what's happened? What, what is going on here? You know, what... you know, some of the opposition to this is about uh, power and the way the internet has given people new powers to relate to the church in different ways. Um, for example, just an easy example. I remember, well, I, I can think of a number of people who've said to me that they, um, this is over the last, again, 10 years or so, they go to their own church out of loyalty and out of family commitment, but they don't really like the priest there. So they come to me afterwards and watch what I've got to say online in my sermon. And that's how yeah. they look at spirituality. Mm -hmm. And you know, it might work the other way. There may be people sitting mm -hmm. in my own congregation who are going off listening to someone who preaches the word much more sounder mm -hmm. than I can. That's a new place, isn't it? Where people have choices like that. Um, okay. you, you can't, it's not just about whether there's a church that you like that you can walk to. It's not just about a church that you like that you can drive mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. but actually what kind of church would you like? And there's an awful lot of fear about the um, kind of shopping trolley mentality of that and shopping around for a church. You hear that as a criticism a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think that's gonna happen anyway. I think that's what the internet does. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I think that trying to undo that is impossible. You can't stop mm -hmm. the internet and say, well, people can't shop around for stuff. Um, and right now with so much online worship going on, people can actually see and can actually judge and can actually make their own minds up as to which church expression is feeding them, fulfilling them, nourishing mm -hmm. them, helping their prayers. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And they will, and they will have a bit from here and they'll have a bit from there and a bit from there. Mm -hmm. um, and we can see that as a threat or we can see that as richness. There, there, there are different mm -hmm. ways of looking at it. Um, but mm -hmm. it does undermine traditional authority structures in the church, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I used to jokingly yeah. say, oh, I'm sorry, Deanna. No, no, go ahead. I, I used to jokingly say when I would do seminars on um, on church in the digital age for like a group of communicators or a group of clergy, and I would talk about, you know, what it means to be church in this age. I would jokingly, which is kind of hauntingly now for me, say, um, I believe if the church had it to do all over again, the church institution had it to do all over again it would never have decided to put a Bible in the vernacular in, uh, in every church. It would, it would never have gotten into, into, into business with the printing press. Um, mm -hmm. And I used to jokingly say that in a sense that um, looking 500 years back, there was such a dispersion and loss of, of, of power in some sense. I mean, we, we know what the printing press did to society. We know how it shifted people's ability to read and to relate to authority. Uh, people have written on that much better than, than I can articulate right now. But I think we're in, a, we're in a similar sort of space right now. And this is the, some of the ongoing tension, which is it, it, we're already out there. We've already, the churches have already ventured into these spaces. And I feel like some of the fear um, that exists, which you were just pointing to, Kelvin, some of the fear that's out there is related to um, the both the sense of loss as well about mm -hmm. what might happen if we if we're willing to go that that far. I think that's we've got to acknowledge that some of those fears are actually grounded. They are actually yeah. realistic. Yeah. Um, yes. And particularly, I think for places where uh, if the local church has an idea of territory, I think mm -hmm. that's very greatly undermined by the internet. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the idea of a parish ministry that's bounded on a map. Is, is changed, it's changed completely and, and has been undermined as people have become mm -hmm. more mobile, but particularly now as people can, can make different online choices as well. Mm -hmm. but I, think, I think the fears are real and, and they, yeah. they should be taken seriously. Yeah. I would, I would, I, I kind of am interested in this issue of like the, the consumerist mentality that is being, you know, people are accusing some of us of, you know, wanting to, 
um, play into a capitalist model. Um, people want Eucharist at home, let's give them Eucharist at home because <laughs> they're demanding it. Um, and you know that's connected to this sense of embodiment that we were talking about, that there's a strong sense that, that the body of Christ needs to gather in person, right? Around a common bread and cup. And so it, it plays, it, it's connected to this strong sense of a theological sense of needing to be gathered in person. For me, as somebody who was um, kind of sidelined from that in-person gathering for a fair amount of time with being really ill, it I've become much more <laughs> aware of how many people don't have access to in-person worship, um, that, um, that there are so many people, right, who are caretaking for other people in their family who are ill or um, disabled or whatever, that they can't get to church and experience that in-person um, gathering, people who have transportation issues, people who are themselves ill, overcome with grief, um, people who are working, medical workers, gas station workers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have such a long list. So um, this idea of, of I mean, one of the things that's become more clear to me is that um, sort of insisting on in-person worship as the only faithful form of worship is really privileging, like mm -hmm. able-bodied, people who have resources to you know make their life revolve around that particular gathering um which so many people are left out of mm. and my own denomination has a pretty robust um guideline for bringing communion to people who are ill etc and i just have been rereading all of this and i was never once offered communion when i was not able to go to worship and i'm thinking I'm probably not alone um, in that. I'm probably not the only one ever who's been really sick and not been connected that way. So um, I think this issue of, you know, talking about the consumerist mentality, um, I don't think that's um, completely absent from this. I would imagine some people are, you know, this is what I want in this kind of cavalier way. But I just, I feel like that is just, skimming the surface of what we're really talking about. And it kind of obscures the, the way in which um, insisting on in-person worship leaves so many people um, out of that equation. I also think that there's something about what's happened in the last 50 odd years that has taught people to desire the sacrament. Mm. The liturgical movement has, has made us do that. It's given us yeah. that. And that's a great gift. It's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. But when people, when this argument, oh, people say they want the sacrament at home, you know, and you just want to give them it. Right. <laughs> well, let's just think about why they want it. They want it because of the ideas of liturgical formation of the, the liturgical movement that have been. I agree. Successful. The church has nurtured yeah. that in that. We've yeah. made that happen. We've right. really made that happen. Um, right. You know, it's not just that people are uh, desiring this out of the blue. They're not just, just, mm -hmm. just thought, well, I know what I need on a Sunday morning. I need. I need <laughs> I need a bit of this. We've actually made that happen as, as, as churches. And it's been hugely, hugely successful. Right. Um, so the consequences of what we're living through now of people desiring and hoping and needing the sacrament in their lives have been nurtured and made, ha made, to, made to happen. And it's Absolutely. a good thing. It's a great thing. And it's, it's even in certain ways almost a bigger framework than liturgical revolution. There's a real mm -hmm. theological revolution. Yeah that has been afoot. And uh, I, I have just been reading uh, in recent days, a book that was published in 2005 by a Catholic writer, Bernice Berteau. And uh, the book is called The Holy Thursday Revolution. Hmm. And uh, this is something that I've been preaching on for probably about five or six years now, especially during Lent and uh, the early part of the Easter season when I've been in churches teaching and preaching. Um, and I've been asking the question, what if the most significant sort of part of the story of Holy Week was what happened on Thursday? Mm -hmm. And, and this I and I think that this is really where our theological imaginations have been moving 
Mm -hmm. in many liturgical churches and I, I think this is true as well for mm -hmm. more progressive and liberal churches like the UCC and the uh, that's the Congregationalists in the United States Kelvin mm -hmm. and the and the Presbyterians certainly have been moving in this direction is you know for the longest time we really didn't pay a whole lot of attention to Thursday we did it was there it was part of the story but it was really only served up Jesus to the Romans mm -hmm. so that the real story could happen on Friday and then on Sunday. But a lot of people have been saying, what if the, the Thursday feast was the last stuff, supper, you know, of the old age and the first feast of the new, of the age that is to come? Mm -hmm. that, that that feast is really the, the absolute hinge in time. And that from Jesus and the disciples' perspective, that was, in a sense, the most important action. Mm -hmm. And that when you place an emphasis on Thursday, what begins to happen is that Friday then takes on the cast of the Romans trying to stop it. The mm -hmm. action of Good Friday mm -hmm. becomes the Romans stepping into the story and saying, mm -hmm. no, we are going to destroy the table mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. it goes anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then... What we know, of course, is that Sunday arri arrives and that for all of the tables that empires have destroyed through all of Israel's history, through all of human history, for every time human beings tried to gather around a table and an empire stepped in and smashed the table and said, no, you're going to submit to us. We control yeah. the food. We control the invitations to this table. That mm -hmm. the Sunday story, after... Mm -hmm. After Thursday, and then the Romans saying, no, we're going to smash the table. The Sunday story becomes God saying, not this time. Mm -hmm. And that what Easter does is it's, it's not just sort of lifting up the work of the broken Christ on the cross and the mm -hmm. sin shed for us. And the sort of the typical what's in our minds from the last 500 years uh, uh, atonement theory. But what has been sneaking through all of the edges of Christian theology, I think in the last couple of decades, is this other vision. And that's the vision of God saying, this is the end of empire. This is the end of the violence against the table. And the table will be set. And then in every single story of the resurrection appearances of Jesus, every one of them happens around a table. Mm -hmm. And so, so when people mm -hmm. say for me that this is a consumerist thing, that yeah. any of us wants communion, when we want it, how we want it, whatever. Mm -hmm. No, I'm opposed <laughs> to empires and, yeah. and mm -hmm. structures coming in and saying and denying the table. Mm. And uh, hasn't, it, hasn't it been interesting going through this crisis at this particular point in the church year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. at first it was, we were going through this in Lent and it was yep. all of it, you know, the words fasting kind of made sense, but not yeah. for long. Right. <laughs> and and I, think, I think the idea of fasting from the Eucharist is a contradiction in terms. It makes no sense. Right. To <laughs> but at right. that moment, at the start of this, that's where we were. And then mm -hmm. this dawning realization that we had to go through Holy Week, what was that going to look like? How were we going to do that? Um, and yet Jesus still did rise from the dead. He, that that mm -hmm. still happens, even though none of us could be there together to greet him. Mm -hmm. We still believed it happened. But then all of these stories that we've been re reading in the last few weeks, yep. um, where Jesus is embodied, but it is not in the way that I've got a body, because he can show up in places that <laughs> right. I can't show up in. Right. You know, he, he is communicating with people in a whole different way through all of that time mm -hmm. and he is still incarnate he mm -hmm. is still the body but it is not this body is not it's not the way this one works mm -hmm. but also like you know at the road to Emmaus like once they recognize mm -hmm. him he's absent so like there's an absence presence yeah. in the resurrection it keeps as well that. Yeah. 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 And, and that the disciples don't recognize him in most of the right. stories right. you know he, uh -huh. he shows up and they go oh wait a second who who are you by the way yeah. is it Emmaus yeah. Thomas yeah. The story yeah. of non-recognition uh yeah. the br br brunch on the beach in John 21 
it's yeah. like who's that guy who's standing on the beach you know and so yeah. so there yeah. i i do think that there there's a very real way mm. kelvin that we can tell the stories of these resurrection appearances as I, I just think that, of the virtual christ yeah absolutely and and yes. he he meets people who are locked away he meets people mm -hmm. who are in lockdown he meets people <laughs> wow. you, you That's know he, great. he reaches beyond their walls he reaches into yeah. them he, he yeah. managed to get out again yeah yeah i mean yeah. that whole story yeah. is our story right now that's how he's meeting yeah. us now it's the yeah same. And he's and guess what? He's doing it with the bread of their tables. <laughs> he he didn't he didn't he didn't show up with a he loaf. Didn't with him. You know, he didn't bring it with him. He 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 showed up um, in this Easter story at bread of people's tables, and it's in that those moments that that he, that he becomes known for 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 being present in that way. And it's usually with fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It isn't so even there's apart. also there's <laughs> also that there you go right 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 but isn't right. that interesting that see mm. that we did the liturgical work in a very real mm. sense yeah um about recentering the table and mm -hmm. and making community and hospitality and you know taking down barriers that all of these mm -hmm. denominations had previously had with things like communion tokens and mm -hmm. uh you know, had to have permission in order to take the eucharist so mm -hmm. so so we've had a 75 years of working on that and then once we did that this kind of the story began to open itself to us in new ways mm -hmm. and you know i i really I, I'm really increasingly convinced um, about this idea that Thursday is the point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. that's what, you know, we're not getting right now. Mm -hmm. And it really, it actually, I think it physically hurts the church mm -hmm. to be denied mm -hmm. the table by the church yeah mm -hmm. that's this is what makes no sense to me at all mm -hmm. um is that we are literally shutting people away from the most mm -hmm. healing part of the story the most dynamic the most mystical the most mysterious in some senses mm -hmm. by saying oh no jesus can't show up here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Deanna, I wonder if you would say something because uh, I wonder if you'd say something about the way in which um, the virtual and the digital has a way of strengthening people's ties to uh -huh. uh, to community and to God and to one another through practice. Uh, I thought the way you you sort of talked about that in your in your book was okay. pretty spectacular. Will you say something about that? Because I think that's also what we're some of the fear here is that people are going to feel uh, like they can just do it from there and the the ties are going to be weak, weakened during this time either right. to god or to the sacraments or to one another but i think part of this is there's a strengthening if we can have a, a positive construction of it there is a strengthening of faith in a tie will you say something about that yeah well i i love this conversation and i think the this you know talking about the centrality of the table and how we've built that up liturgically and then you know thinking about the move from Monday, Thursday through the resurrection stories mm -hmm. as um, speaking directly to this time is just really mm -hmm. fabulous. Mm -hmm. And as we talked about before we were on air being recorded, mm -hmm. um, I think one of the challenges, big issues is that we have not done, um, or people haven't thought through theologically what virtual reality is and what it mm -hmm. can do. And I think that assumption that it is always inferior um, is one of the big problems. And I was helped a number of years ago by Jason Biasi's little post about virtual theological education, where he talked about that the body of Christ has always been a virtual body from the very, mm -hmm. very beginning. Paul was almost never physically with those he considered <laughs> members of the body, right? And that's why we have his letters, which is, his form of virtual presence with the body of Christ. Um, and Biasi says, you know, in some ways, those letters, the way he was virtually present was really inferior to per in-person presence. But in other ways, it was superior. 
And that second part to me has been just such a helpful um, reframing. And I think that's kind of what we, I really want the church to be thinking about this right now, which is um, how, you know, cause I, what I'm hearing from a lot of people is just how inferior the, the form is, right? You can't do this. I can't see other people. I can't touch them in the same way. Um, all the problems that we're talking about with the Eucharist um, meanwhile, there are some advantages. <laughs> um, and this mm -hmm. brings in people who've been, you know, cut off from uh, the in-person experience. They're now part of this um, experience. It, I was in a, I've been part of these virtual coffee hours at my church, and it was fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, we did a conversation about what what are some of the losses that you've experienced with this form of worship and what are some of the things that are maybe surprises and it was fascinating to hear people who i mean what i'm hearing is that more people actually in a household are tending to go to church right now you know um people would be you know just one person from the house would be going to church but now the whole family is sitting mm -hmm. and being a part of this like what what is that helping us understand as the church um, mm -hmm. about this particular mode? Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I've heard people say, like, I am listening so much more closely to the sermon <laughs> because mm -hmm. I feel like you're talking directly <laughs> to me and I can't yeah. kind of look away or do anything yeah. else. Um, you know, and um, and the kind of creativity, like you were talking about, Diana, with the like, with music that's been going on with some of these apps that people are using and how mm -hmm. the music is coming through, the way in which, I mean, we're using visual images in our worship service in a way that, that our church did, doesn't have screens, any of that, right? But now they invite um, kids in the congregation to do artwork that connects to the theme of the sermon, et cetera. So we're seeing these great pieces of art by members of our mm. congregation. Um, and so there, I, I think it's gonna be really important for us moving forward to encourage our churches to pay attention to what surprises, what moments of grace are coming through this virtual connection. And, I, and I'm as willing as anyone to lament some of the losses, right? I mean, I, I, yeah. I think that's really important to lift up that there are ways in which um, I'm grieving, other people are grieving. There's, there's things that we're missing that are really, really mm -hmm. sad. And, and mm -hmm. lament is an important um, practice for us to do um, communally and individually. At the same time, there are ways in which um, this virtual connectedness is allowing um, the church to be the church and to minister to the weakest among us in ways that it hasn't been doing as good of a job doing recently, I think. So um, I think it's also possible to allow people to bring their own gifts to the worship right. as well. Um, I mean, a bit like you were just describing with, with uh, children bringing their images. I, I did that with adults. I, I uh, a few weeks ago, asked people to take a photograph of their empty streets, you know, the streets that yeah. don't have traffic on them. Yeah. Uh, and then we blended all that together with a choir piece that began, with, uh, you know, may the road rise to meet you. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. that's that's amazing. Amazing. You know, people didn't really remember Great. my sermon that week, but <laughs> really, really remember that. Exactly. And, and that was their own gifts being brought to an altar, to a table, to be shared. Right. Mm -hmm. They were taking something and making something as a as a community. And lots of people wanted to send in a photograph that I hadn't heard from really. Before. Yeah. They saw, you know, for weeks. Right. And there was their photograph, and then that created something that was beautiful. Now that was a long way from just pointing a camera at what used to happen in church. Yeah. Right. And I think I, I'm interested in. There are some people who want to do online worship by pointing a camera at what used to happen in church and that's mm -hmm. how you share it. Mm -hmm. That's not been my experience. I, I don't want to criticize that because that's what yeah. some people want. Mm -hmm. But that's not my experience and trying to work a little bit more with the medium, knowing that it mm -hmm. is social and trying to uh, allow a little bit of that social reality into the worship uh, has helped. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. absolutely visual images, this is the age of, of, of the image, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, I mean, I've been fascinated by all the 
uh, clergy I've seen preaching and behind them, just like with Joshua now, there's an icon. Uh, yeah. So many, if you look at so many of our preachers, they are motivated by visual images. And mm -hmm. now is that moment. Now is the yeah. moment to bring those mm -hmm. images and, mm -hmm. and share them and talk about them. And, uh, yeah. Not just be, you, you know, your own talking head like we're all doing now, yeah. Yeah. But, actually, yeah. but actually present something of what has been inspiring us. Because right. that return to looking at, at visual images is very, very mm -hmm. clear. You can see it on people's mm -hmm. bookshelves. Yeah, I can tell you in our in my in my own uh, community, as the moment we realized that we were going to need to uh, to go from live streaming to uh, to to live streaming 2.0, and we began to pay attention to what people have been watching for the last decade that we've mm -hmm. live streamed, um, then you begin to ask a different question about mm -hmm. how you are uh, <laughs> creating. I mean, and look, we. Christ Church has, has done an amazing job and been doing it for a long time of giving people access to worship on Sunday mornings via via live stream. Um, but I feel like some of this nuance here between um, how you uh, broadcast something for people to consume versus as a mech, as a as a as a medium or a means by which people uh, are choosing to participate in worship. Right. is a total learning edge for the church in so many different ways. This isn't uh, how can Christ Church be the next best series on Netflix. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about nurturing a an environment within which, an ecology almost, within which yeah. people's experience of community, people's experience of the divine, people's experience of, of, of relationship are, uh, are intensified. And I think for me, that's also where some of this, you know, this sense of how this is a sacramental conversation is important for me. I think that, you mm -hmm. know, the break, the breaking of the breaking of bread and the sharing of cup and wine, these are all meant to be, I think it was Joseph Martos who said this, you know, they're meant to be intensification rituals that help someone right. grow in their faith and not just grow in their faith, but go out into the world and, and live that faith. And if, if that is true, um, then I got to be honest to think that there are people who, as I've watched Deanna's community, who are willing to sort of set up an altar in their home mm -hmm. and to participate authentically um, in, uh, in the prayers of the church and to, and to seek to be transformed by the religious experience that is coming via digital means is, I mean... Uh, um, it's moving to me. This isn't this isn't trite consumption. This is an yeah. authentic expression of deep and abiding faith. That um, you know, w when you ask what are we putting out there, in that regard, it's a whole it's a whole different conversation. And I think for me, it's it's a conversation about integrity. It, it is a it is a how is what we're putting out there. Uh, being honest and um, and how is it creating an environment for people's faith to be grown and deepened and um, and encouraging them to live with the grace that they're receiving because I think that's part of what's going on when uh, the conversation seems to be moving into this place of image community mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. nature of reality and mm -hmm. um, two two responses that I've gotten in in recent days have been astonishing to me. And one is from a clergy person, another is from a lay person. And the, the clergy person was a Lutheran woman uh, clergy. And she was very reluctant to do any kind of online Eucharist. And she actually read the two pieces that Deanna and I had in the Church Anew blog and told me that those two pieces really convinced her that mm. she at least wanted to offer communion to her, wow. her people. And mm -hmm. so she told them that they were going to do a Zoom communion. And, mm -hmm. you know, she sent a little email, you know, have wine or grape mm -hmm. juice and bread or crackers, you know, some, something that is a real approximation or the actual thing uh, available. And we're going to, you know, I'll do the prayer. And when we get to a certain place, we'll all hold up our elements to the camera. Mm -hmm. And so she, she said there she was doing it just on the camera as she would do it in the church. And when she picked up the bread and wine and she looked at the, the screen, 
Oof. had all these images mm -hmm. of her congregation and they were all holding mm -hmm. bread and wine Gosh. and she said it was at that moment she started to cry mm -hmm. because she never understood communion as community mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. she actually saw her congregation blessing mm -hmm. all of the bread and wine together she said when we were in the church it was virtual because i did it wow. but when we were on mm -hmm. zoom it was real because yeah. we all did it mm -hmm. wow and mm -hmm. that just wow. that just blew me away you know because you know you write mm -hmm. a blog and you never think you're going to get that <laughs> and she really she got a whole new vision of what community That's amazing. was you know because yeah. of the images that were on yeah. her screen yeah she saw her people yeah. differently yeah. wow and then the other story i got was uh from a a woman who's who's a little whose story's a little bit more like yours deanna she's had a very painful experience with cancer and the church has come to mm. mean everything to her and um you know not being able to go is really terrible in terms of her own spiritual life and so mm. her church and this is an episcopal church is a church that was actually given permission by the bishop to broadcast the eucharist um just as a kind of like a spiritual communion for people mm -hmm. but she said that the that the service had become so dissatisfying that she actually turned it off during the eucharist and that then she read the blog that that i put up and some of the the, the controversy that had been surrounding it and so she decided that she was going to set up an altar in her house and mm -hmm. do communion with it. And so she wrote me this letter mm -hmm. about how she went mm -hmm. and she dug out of um, some box or suitcase, someplace in her attic, her grandmother's old damask tablecloth that she had been mm -hmm. given as a wedding present. And she mm -hmm. went and she got pieces of the best china that she had and pulled out the silver and set up this altar in her living room that was decked in these beautiful mm -hmm. things that had been part of her family tradition for over several generations. Mm -hmm. And instead of turning the, the internet off when they got to it, she actually stood there mm -hmm. with the priest in effect and held her hands over the bread and wine mm -hmm. and quietly said the prayers as the priest was saying them with the priest and then she took took the eucharist and the way she described this the level of reverence mm -hmm. yeah. that she as a lay person brought to this at her own fear she said that she was afraid that you know was god gonna you know was mm -hmm. the yeah. building get struck by lightning or something and instead mm -hmm. she said it was one of the most profound spiritual experiences she'd had and and i could just the image of her in this room with her grandmother's tablecloth and with the mm -hmm. family china and mm -hmm. the bread and wine mm -hmm. i don't think i've ever I, I, it was mm -hmm. one of those beautiful letters i've ever gotten mm -hmm. it was literary in its mm -hmm. its power <laughs> and and both of those letters one from the mm -hmm. clergy person who finally saw the face of her community in the yeah. bread mm -hmm. and wine mm -hmm. and one from a lay person who connected through time, all of this beauty mm -hmm. and the generations mm -hmm. of her family with this action mm -hmm. over the internet to experience the healing of this, of the mm -hmm. table. Mm -hmm. I thought, it's powerful. You know, are we going to, do we deny those things? Mm -hmm. Right. Say that those aren't real. Mm -hmm. I, I heard a story um, from uh, the Diocese of Atlanta from a person who uh, had gone they got, everyone had, had gone all all digital all virtual and not from their buildings from from various locations and uh, this one and a priest reached out to a person in his congregation who i think was 99 years old and um, and uh and this person hadn't been able to attend church in forever just had not been able to attend church and called this person and asked them to do a reading for uh for the service that was coming up and the person figured out how to do use get got someone to help them do the technology got the recording done did the recording had it sent in and in response to the 
to the rector, to the priest who in, invited her to do this said, um, after all these years of not being able to participate in my church, and it's been my and it's been my church, I feel like you gave me my church back. I feel like you gave me my my sense right. of of faith and and place back. And you know, when I when I listen to your stories as well, I mean, it's that sense that um, I think as an Episcopalian. Like our theology is that people are meant to be participating with us in the praying of the sacraments all the time. It's not just some magic. It's not just some clergy clerical sort of sense of what's going on. There's a sharing in the prayer that's embodied all the time. And I how, think how do, this, deal, how do we deal with the people who, uh, I, I would call them the impossibilists, you know, uh, they, yeah. I mean, I'm told sometimes by people with absolute certainty that this cannot happen. And I, first of all, I want to know how to get on the committee that decides whether it happens. <laughs> because I, I, I've got no idea who appoints it or when it meets or anything like that. But absolute certainty that God cannot do this is a very odd thing for people to express. And yet I've heard it quite a lot recently. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just wonder, it reminds me of the absolute certainty with which people told me that women could not be ordained because God could not do this. It reminds me of the absolute certainty of people saying that a gay couple could not be married because God could not do this. It was a category error. The, the words did not make sense and God was not in the business of, of that kind of process. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the certainty reminds me of both those instances. And I wonder whether that resonates with anyone. Well, I, I think, yeah, my kind of sense with that is back to the comment about the virtual body of Christ is happening, you know, whether the, or not the church acknowledges it. Um, you know, women use their gifts for ministry, LGBT, QIA folks have done, have been ministers of the gospel, even when the church hasn't um, kind of officially endorsed them. Um, so I, I think part of what we're seeing is, um, so many churches, so many people who are um, demonstrating as your stories illustrate that people can do this well, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I fully believe people can do this poorly. <laughs> but let's, <laughs> let's help them do it well. Um, no, and I think it, they we're- They can do it really um, poorly in church too. They can do it really yeah. Exactly, right, exactly. <laughs> and, and so, I think that part of what I'm seeing, I'm starting to hear that there are places in the Lutheran church, for example, that are going to have new conversations about, you know, maybe changing uh, the, the position of the church, you know, as we continue on in the pandemic. And um, so I think the demonstration that people can um, be participating in the body of Christ, be faithful to their traditions, that it's out of a love of the church and a love of God mm -hmm. that we're doing these things. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that kind of witness um, is part of what is going to help kind of move mm -hmm. things in a different direction. Um, rather than, I'm not sure it's going to be effective to go toe to toe with the, those who are absolutely certain it can't happen. Mm -hmm. I, I think of a lot of the stories in the New Testament where people told Jesus that something was impossible. <laughs> and one of the stories I like the best right now is the story of the centurion who comes to yeah. Jesus and says, yeah. you know, would, I, would you heal, heal my slave? And I, I, I looked it up just so we could make sure we all had remembered the story. It's it. And, and it says, you know, when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, appealing to him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible distress. And he said to him, I will come and cure him. And the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only mm -hmm. speak the word and my mm -hmm. servant will be healed. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens is that Jesus doesn't go to the house and mm -hmm. doesn't touch the guy. But, the, mm -hmm. but we have in right there, Matthew 8, a remote healing, mm -hmm. a, a virtual healing, you know. And mm -hmm. so 
and what Jesus says of this is when people said, well, wait a second, you know, that can't happen. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. And in a very real sense, I think that that's a thread, you know, even though this is a very particular dramatic episode of it, but we have that thread all through the yeah. New Testament where people say, well, no, Lord, you can't heal that person or you can't cure on a Sabbath or, mm -hmm. you know, blah, blah, blah. And in every one of those cases, mm -hmm. Jesus says, well, <laughs> sorry. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, so, so yeah. the Bible itself, the, the gospels itself just provides such powerful counterweight yeah. to the impossibilists. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that sort of sense of um of toe to toe as you as you just referenced is also, you know, one of the stories that comes to my mind uh, from scripture is the story of um Jesus with the woman at the well. And um she she looks at him and is sort of like, So tell me, uh, is it this mountain or this mountain? And maybe you remember the story. Jesus Jesus looks at her and he says, Neither. We will, we will worship in spirit and we'll worship in truth. I feel like this is one of those moments that we're engaged in a conversation about whether we're talking about this mountain or whether we're talking about this mountain. And, and part of what I think uh, and what, uh, what I'm appreciating about this conversation and even with conversations that I'm having with people who are my friends but are, are, see things totally differently is that um, what we're after is a cultivation of wisdom and spirit here. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think the more we can lean into the wisdom of, of spirit and what the spirit is saying to the church in this moment and, and how the church can, um, can do what Jesus asks us to do, which is to feed his sheep, then, you know, the, the more we can, I think, um, not have to sort of lean into the this mountain or that mountain kind of uh, d debates, though I, though I think that will continue to happen as we, as we keep going along in the conversation. Um, mm -hmm. There's something, just as you said that, that I didn't even realize about my own passion until mm. just this very minute. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I pointed towards it at the very beginning when I said people came to me and asked me the question about, well, what, a, what, what about churches and pandemics? You know, the historical mm -hmm. question. And I, I replied by saying, well, in the past, the church has always run toward the, mm. this, the, those who are sick run toward the pandemics. And mm -hmm. that has been one of the ways in which the church has done mission work. One of the ways the church has grown by that witness to running toward mm -hmm. what was frightening. Mm -hmm. And then I had said, but now we can't, we have to stay locked at home. Mm -hmm. And what, what just occurred to me when you all have been talking is that in a very real way, this conversation and what I think I've been trying to say all along is we need to run toward this. Yeah. We need to run mm -hmm. toward what is, what is scary and unfamiliar. And even mm -hmm. though it can't be holding the hands of the actual people who are dying in the coronavirus wards, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. can be running toward the world mm -hmm. in some way that we are really holding the hand of the hungry and those who are spiritually suffering at this moment. And the frightened too. The people in, yep. in, in their own homes are frightened. Mm -hmm. That's right. And we have to be with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the, the, the elements, the bread and the wine um, in this time where we do experience a sense of being physically distant from each other, that the affirmation that we have um, a, an incarnational faith, um, mm -hmm. that that's one of the few places where it can be affirmed right now mm -hmm. is in the bread and the wine um, mm -hmm. in, you know, during online worship, that a lot of our experiences are not physically connected with other people right now. And let's affirm the incarnational reality that we we say we believe in and and promote this way to have a tangible connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I want to say thanks for the conversation. I I don't know um, if anybody has any other hopes or any other um, things that you just want to 
uh, ad and conversation. I've, I've really enjoyed this and, uh, and I'm thankful that we'll have to do it again sometime. Maybe <laughs> post pandemic, we good. find a way to, we find a way to also do it uh, yeah. in, in physical proximity to one another in some that sort of way. Any, that would be great. Any, <laughs> anybody have any just closing thoughts or prayers or hopes that you want to, uh, that you want to add as we prepare to, to log off here? Just to, I think I want to say that, that I think we're the people who don't know what's coming next, and that's okay. Yeah. 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 And I just want to add my thanks to you, Joshua, for bringing us together. It's been yeah. great to get to have a conversation, a very rich, um, mm -hmm. theologically deep conversation with yeah. all of you about this, and blessings to you as you continue to imagine what the church should be at this time mm -hmm. and place. Mm -hmm. I feel so grateful for the three of you, because when I put out a few words about this online, I felt very alone. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. then to find that there were some other people who were passionate about this and thinking about it well, from very interesting perspectives, I felt like I learned from all three of you in the, mm -hmm. the articles mm -hmm. that you put into the world. And you made me think more, as you have already here, you know, as we've gathered virtually and I've realized things about my own, my own senses of theology. And what I think it represents is that the four of us are just a small tip of that iceberg. I suspect there are a lot of people thinking beautifully and well about this right now and who are longing for this presence of God and for the church to just say, you know, let's not be afraid. Mm. Mm. Amen. Yeah. Well, thanks y'all again for um, just the opportunity. I think my, my ongoing hope and my ongoing prayer is that um, through whatever means possible, um, God and God's spirit will just keep finding ways to animate God's self and God's spirit in people's lives. And that uh, the contagion of hope and of faith and of presence that we believe uh, comes from God uh, will we'll, uh, find even more ways through the church in all of its forms uh, to show up right where people are, right when they need it, and, and sometimes even right when they least expect it. Um, and, 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 and even in those times when they do. So, um, uh, thanks for, uh, thanks for your time and for the conversation and I'll look forward to seeing you guys again real soon. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. See ya.